Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Quarters studio. Welcome to the show. So in today's episode, I've got a very special deck tech that's all about reflections. So the ground rules for my deck techs are as follows. The budget is $50 or less, and that's an overall deck cost. So that cost includes shipping, as well as commanders, as long as they're $10 or less, but basic lands will not be included in that price. On my deck techs, I'm going to take you through the strategy, the tactics, and how the deck wins. Today's episode is a patron-selected deck tech. Once a month, patrons get to vote on what commander that they'd like to see in an upcoming episode. The commander that gets the most votes wins. And the commander that they chose was Riku of Two Reflections. Riku is a 2-2 human wizard that costs two blue, red, green. He has, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may pay blue, red. If you do copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. And whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay green, blue. If you do, put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield. So Riku can copy spells as well as creatures. Now there are a lot of directions that you can take a Riku deck, but the one that I decided was using clones to copy incredibly powerful creatures. These powerful creatures are going to be non-legendary, so Riku's copies will stick around and our clones will stick around as well. And the best part about this deck, Riku can make a copy of that clone too. So with just one creature and one clone, we can get basically four copies of that powerful creature. And just a quick note, at the time of this recording, Riku's price is well over $10, so its price isn't going to be included in the cost. So in the price breakdown, you won't see in the average deck cost or the cost of this deck. So the strategy for this deck is very straightforward. We're going to clone and copy powerful cards multiple times. With the amount of value that Riku can generate, things can get out of hand really quickly. And in terms of how we're going to win with this deck, well, we're going to overwhelm our opponents with an absurd number of one powerful creature. Some of these creatures have incredibly powerful ETBs, and others benefit us with the more of them that are in play. You'll see when we get to them, though. And as always, with these deck techs, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. So let's start things off with tactic number one, this land is your land. And first up, there's Bond of Fertility, which is kind of like Wayfarer's Bomble, but it's an enchantment and it's green. <clears throat> anyway, Search for Tomorrow is another fantastic turn one play. We can suspend two for a green, and it also is going to get us a basic land into play, but this time untapped. Next up, we've got three great turn two plays with Rampant Growth, Growth Spiral, and Sakura Tribe Elder. Rampant Growth gives us one basic into play tap. Growth Spiral lets us draw a card and put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield, and we can sacrifice the Kur Tribe Elder to get a basic land into play tapped. Next up, there's Harrow, which is a great spell to copy with Riku, because it's going to make us only sacrifice one land, and then we get four lands into play untapped. When you copy a spell, that extra cost isn't paid an extra time. And then Cultivate gets us one basic into our hand, and one into play tapped, and then there's Growth from the Ashes, which if we kicked it, gets us two basics into play untapped. And next up, we essentially have three better explosive vegetations with Secrutus Route, Migration Path, and Vastwood Surge. Next up, there's Spring Bloom Druid, which is basically a hero on a body. And then when Paragon Trade comes into play, we untap up to five lands. So both of these can be great targets for a clone and a copied clone when needed. And finally, another great spell to copy is Brass's Bounty. Because with it, for each land that we control, we get a treasure. And doubling that up can give us a lot of temporary mana advantage. And speaking of advantage, let's move on to some card advantage. So now let's move on to tactic number two. Can you dig it? Anyone else ever seen the movie The Warriors? No? Okay. Just me. <clears throat> Anyways, first up there's Coiling Oracle, which can either get us a land into play or a card into our hand, depending on what's on the top of our library. And then Risen Reef does the exact same thing, but it also counts other elementals coming into play too. So cloning this card a couple of times can get out of control quickly. Speaking of elementals, we're also going to be running Muldrifter, which when it comes into play, we draw two cards. But we also have some card draw enchantments up as well with Garrick's Uprising and Teamer Ascendancy. Both are going to draw us a card whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under our control. Most of our clone targets are going to be bigger creatures, so we're going to be drawing a lot of cards with these. And on top of that, Garrick's Uprising draws us a card when it comes into play, and it also gives our creatures Trample, and Teamer Ascendancy also gives our creatures Haste. Next up we've got Frantic Search, which is essentially a free loot spell. It lets us draw 2, discard 2, then untap 3 lands. And then Rain of Revelation lets us draw 3 and discard 1. And then Factor Fiction essentially puts our opponents in a tough spot, having to choose which cards out of the top 5 to give us. 
Next up, there's Epiphany the Drown Yard, which is basically a reverse factor fiction, but for X. And then Read the Runes is another X spell that lets us draw X, and then for each card drawn this way, we discard a card unless we sacrifice a permanent. And finally, there's Rape the Pass, which lets us bring back X cards at random from our graveyard to our hand, and we exile it. Now, what are some cards that we're hoping to draw into, though? Let's find out in tactic number three, Doppelganger. We're going to be running plenty of clones in this deck, including Mirror Image and Protean Raider. Mirror Image can copy any of our creatures, and Protean Raider can copy any creature on the battlefield as long as we attacked with a creature. Next up, we've got Clone, which is a clone. In fact, it's the original clone, which is why all the clones are called Clone. Understand? And then there's Vizier Many Faces, which is an Embalm clone, and Wall of Stolen Identity, which is a Wall clone. And Wall clone also has Defender, and it's going to tap down the creature that it cloned until it leaves play. Next up, we've got some 5-mana clones, starting with Mercurial Pretender. It's a clone that we can bounce back to our hand to recast. And then we've got Morph Clone with Vesuvian Shapeshifter, which can basically change when it's morphing, and it can unmorph, and morph stuff. And then Bonnie Double is a clone, but for Graveyard, so if there's a good creature in a Graveyard, we can just clone that. Now, as good as many of these clones are, there's one that stands above the rest, and in fact, it stands above every other card in this deck. And that's going to be the Golden Pick of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pick of this deck is Progenitor Mimic. Progenitor Mimic is a 0-0 shapeshifter that costs 4 green blue. You may have Progenitor Mimic enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, if this creature isn't a token, create a token that's a copy of this creature. So basically, this is a clone that continues to make copies of the thing that it cloned. This deck is built around making a ton of copies of a powerful creature, and this clone does a lot of heavy lifting by itself. If this sticks around for just a few turns, the amount of value that this can generate is absurd. And that's what makes Progenitor Mimic the Golden Pig. But we're not quite done with our clone effects just yet. So now let's move on to tactic number 4, Double Goer. First up, we've got Quasi Duplicate, Cackling Counterpart, and Fade Infatuation, each of which are going to make a copy of a creature that we control. On top of that, Quasi Duplicate has Jumpstart, Cackling Counterpart has Flashback, and Fade Infatuation lets us scry two if it's our turn. And remember, if we have the mana, Riku can copy these spells as well. And 5 mana for 2 copies of an incredibly powerful creature is not a bad deal. Next up, there's Mythos of Aluna, which can make a copy of a permanent, but basically if we use red-green, it can also fight if it's a creature. And then Sahili's Artistry can make us multiple copies, one of a creature and one of an artifact. Speaking of multiple copies, there's Spitting Image, which says create a token that's a copy of target creature, and it's got Retrace. So because of Retrace, we can recast this card from our graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other cost. Now we've talked a lot about clones so far, but what are some of those creatures that we actually want to clone? Let's go through some now that can help us throw a wrench into our opponent's plans in tactic number 5, Blast Zone. First up, we've got Duplicant and Phyrexian and Jester, which both exile a creature when they come into play. Duplicant gets just as big as that creature was, and Phyrexian and Jester gets even bigger, essentially plus 3 plus 3. Next up, there's Thorn Mammoth, which says, whenever it or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Thorn Mammoth fights up to one target creature you don't control. Getting multiple copies of Thorn Mammoth can be brutal. We can fight and take out pretty much all of our opponent's small creatures and even some bigger ones as well. And then next up, we've got Reclamation Sage, which is going to destroy target artifact or enchantment when it comes into play. Acidic Slime does the exact same thing, but it also has Death Touch, and it can destroy land. And then we've got Terracidon, which destroys up to three non-creature permanents, but for each permanent put into a graveyard this way, its controller creates a 3-3 green elephant creature token. That's a small price to pay for blowing three things up, though. And again, by cloning this a few times, we've got some big threats, and we got rid of a ton of things. And speaking of getting rid of a ton of things, finally there's Tyrant of Discord. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent chooses a permanent they control at random and sacrifices it. If a non-land permanent is sacrificed this way, repeat this process. So with a few clones of this and the right things chosen at random, this can wipe out a ton of things. But these aren't the only ways to throw a wrench into our opponent's plans. So now let's move on to tactic number 6, Counterproductive. First up, we've got Repudiate, which is going to counter target activated or triggered ability. And the other side of that is Replicate, which can create a token that's a copy of a creature we control. So this is a flexible card that can help us out in multiple situations. But next up, we've got some more standard counter spells with Negate, Disdainful Stroke, and Neutralize. Negate can counter target non-creature spell, Disdainful Stroke can counter target spell with a converted mana cost of 4 or greater, and Neutralize is going to counter any spell, and we can cycle it for 2. Now, talking about counter spells is fun and all, but it's time for us to get into the part of the show that I'm really looking forward to. Because now it's time for us to start talking about incredibly powerful creatures that we want a lot of copies of. So now let's move on to tactic number 7, Assemble the Army. First up there's Hornet Queen, which when it comes into play we create 4 one, one green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch. So 5 creatures for 1, all with death touch, and if we copy it with Riku, that's 10 creatures with death touch. Sounds fun. Oh, and then if we actually cast a clone and then copy that clone and made more clones of it, that's 20. 20 creatures with death touch, what could be more fun? How about a herd of Rampaging Baylos? Rampaging Baylos has landfall, and whenever land comes into play, we get a 4-4 beast. 
So a couple copies of this, a couple of lands coming into play, maybe some ramp spells, and we've got an army of beasts. But how are we going to get our army through? Perhaps a copy or two of Georager could help. It has landfall whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, goad each creature target player controls. So if we've got an extra copy of this and we just have one land come into play, we get to goad two entire armies. That means they have to swing their entire army at someone else and they're leaving themselves wide open. And then N-Race Forerunners can help us out as well. When it comes into play, other creatures we control get plus two plus two and gain vigilance and trample until end of turn. A couple of copies of this in the same turn and we've got plus four plus four plus six plus six, you get the picture. Or we don't even have to get our creatures through if we're attacking with a bunch of Hellriders. It says whenever a creature you control attacks, Hellrider deals one damage to defending player. So if we've got four of them in play, whenever one of our creatures attacks, it's going to deal four damage to that defending player. And that's just with attacking, not even counting the damage of when it comes through. Now, all this is fun and all, but we're not quite done talking about powerful creatures. So let's move on to tactic number eight. Remember the Titans. Yet another movie reference. I bet more of you know this movie than the Warriors. Regardless, moving on, first up we've got Inferno Titan and Frost Titan. And we can't use the other Titan in green because it's banned. Anyways, Inferno Titan has when it enters the battlefield or attacks it deals 3 damage divided as you choose among 1, 2, or 3 targets. So this pings on ETB and on attack, so getting a couple of copies of this can be brutal. And then Frost Titan has when it enters the battlefield or attacks tap target permanent, it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So having a few of these in play can really lock down a couple of key permanents on the battlefield. Or with enough of them in play, lands. Who said that? Anyways, moving on to more powerful creatures in tactic number 9, Over the Top. First up, Dilubium Primordial. When it enters the battlefield for each opponent, you may cast up to one target instant or sorcery card from that player's graveyard without paying its mana cost. If a card cast this way, it will be put into a graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So yeah, three spells for one creature is an incredible deal, especially when we can clone it and copy it, etc, etc. And then when Molten Primordial enters the battlefield for each opponent, we gain control of up to one target creature that player controls until end of turn. We untap those creatures and they gain haste until end of turn. So yeah, we threaten three creatures, then we copy this, then we threaten three more creatures, then we clone it, and then we threaten three more creatures. So yeah, using everyone else's armies against them, great deal. But perhaps the deadliest thing to have copies of is Tidespout Tyrant. It says whenever you cast a spell, return target permanent to its owner's hand. Notice it said permanent, not non-land permanent. So if you've got let's say six of these in play and you bounce everything back to everyone's hands except for lands well eventually you you gotta bounce the lands right i mean you gotta target something and the game's gotta end right <clears throat> changing the subject let's move on to tactic number 10 token time one of the most valuable cards in this deck to draw later in the game depending on the situation might be second harvest it says for each token you control create a token that's a copy of that permanent so basically, if you've got a lot of tokens that are copies of powerful creatures, you get double that now. So you get all those ETBs if they've got ETBs, or just more copies of Tides Bounce Tyrant to bounce lands, or whatnot. Anyways, a different but still very powerful approach comes with Bruticlad. It says creature tokens you control have haste. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 2-1 blue mirror artifact creature token. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. Essentially, this lets you turn all of your tokens into one token. So if throughout the game you created tokens of other things, you can turn them into the most optimal token at the time that you need them. All those insects with Hornet Queen or those rampaging Baloth beasts now become copies of Tidespawn Tyrant. Again, kind of mean, but incredibly powerful, so have fun. But now that we've gone through the cards, it's time for us to go on to the price breakdown. And again, because Riku's price is over $10, it's not going to be included in either of these costs. The average Riku deck is going to set you back $320.56. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at $42.31. And with all that money that we're saving, let's take a look at some reasonable upgrades to consider. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, which we're going to add in by taking out Fauna Fertility. Next up, let's add in Clever Impersonator by taking out Mercurial Pretender. And then let's add in Glasspool Mimic by taking out Nyland. Next up, let's add in Stunt Double by taking out Wall of Stolen Identity. And then let's add in Altered Ego by taking out Zahili's Artistry. Finally, let's add in Ride Replication by taking out Spitting Image. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn to hear from you. So in the comments below, why don't you reflect on this deck tech and let me know your thoughts. And as always, thanks again and have a good one.